Greetings, Noose Little Pod listeners. This is your host, Matt Gore, reminding you to please like, follow, subscribe, and share the podcast on your available podcast apps such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and any other podcast app you can think of. Share our episodes on Facebook and let us know what you think with a comment or review. Now please enjoy the show. Good evening and welcome to Noose Little Podcast. This is an audio program talking about the backstage antics and stories of running a small town community theater on the banks of the Noose River located in Smithfield, North Carolina. We lovingly refer to the old girl as the Hut. We hope you enjoy. Good evening and welcome to a very special episode of Noose Little Podcast. I have promised you a ghost walk spooky episode for about a year and a half now. And we didn't get to do it last year because of weather and technical difficulties. But finally, this year, we have it for you. That is right. We have the ghost walk for the Johnston... ah, The ghost walk at Historic Riverside Cemetery. This happened on Thursday, October 27th, 2022. Uh... Our good friend Mita Tool was there recording with the field mic, and we are all actually recording on the field mic right now as the set is being constructed above our heads. So if you hear some banging around up there, that's just Steven, you know, intentionally being loud because he knows we're recording a podcast. So, all right, let's get to it. Um, Mita was kind enough to go out last night and record each of our uh, ghosts. Uh, and how was that experience, Mita? It was good. I got there a little late, but... Uh... It wasn't too bad. Not rainy or anything? No, no rain. Good. So we had one, two, three. We have six ghosts to go through here, so we better go ahead and get started because we don't want to make this episode too terribly long. Uh, first up, he was recorded separately, so the sound might be a little bit uh, wonky because he had a cut out a little bit early, so we recorded him today, actually. But our good friend Greg Hill is, uh, portrayed John O'Neill, and he was a colonial insurrectionist. So it kind of looks like these ghosts are going in like chronological order almost. Maybe. Okay. So, th- all right. So, Colonial Insurrectionist John O'Neill. Okay, go ahead and enjoy that. Good evening, fellow citizens of Johnson County. My name is John O'Neill, and I have come back here to tell ye a story that took place in the sultry summer of our year, of our Lord 1768. Back in those days, settlers were just pouring into these parts because of all the cheap land that was here for the taking. There was a lot of roughneck farmers in them days. A bunch of them run out of Virginia because the pappies gave all the land to the oldest son. That was the way things was done back then. It was called primal genitor. The oldest boy usually got everything and the younger boys might get a pig or a cow if they was lucky. Down in Carolina, a man could lay claim on any land he wanted and not even have to pay credit to it until the survey and all paperwork was done. Sometimes it took years before they started paying the quit rents. You know what quit rents are, right? They're the taxes paid to the king and his government every year. Back then, the sheriff and his deputies were the ones that went around and made people pay up. Well, if the sheriff took a notion, he could charge extra just for his trouble. People fussed over paying because not everybody had coins, which was what the king liked to get paid. Some people paid in tobacco, and some just didn't pay. I want to ask you good folks something. Do you think it is right to make people with poor, rocky land pay the same tax on an acre that those rich planters paid on their rich dirt? Well, I don't think so either. But that's the way taxes were set up back in them days. Well, if you didn't pay, they'd come in and they'd start selling the beds, the clothes, and even the women's petticoats. One way or the other, them taxes had to get paid. Well, things got interesting after his royal majesty, King George, sent his opidiness William Tryon to be governor of North Carolina in 1765. Old Governor Tryon decided to build a big old fancy house over there in Newburn and make us poor farmers pay for it with higher taxes. Some of us decided we just weren't going to take it sitting down. We started up a uh, petition where I didn't have much education and I didn't know how to draw up one of those petitions, but I got old Elmore Henley to draw it up. 
We took it around and got a bunch of names on it. Then we got 80 fellas together and made our plans to march down to the courthouse at Hinton's Quarter and take charge. Somehow or the other though, the sitting justices in the court found out what we was up to. They cancelled court and went out and recruited a bunch of their buddies and they was waiting for us. They had some big old clubs and they got the best of us. I was arrested as an insurgent and hold off to the Newburn jail. Some of my old friends from over in Edgecombe thought they could bust me out. Instead of busting me out, one of them got his head busted, another got his horse shot. They would have run out of Newburn and I was stuck in jail for trying to help protect the rights of the poor people. They called us regulators. Pretty soon though, old Tryon decided to pardon some of the regulators. But there was 13 men he refused to pardon. I let you guess who one of them was. It looked like I was going to be hanged, but I somehow managed to get out. And how I managed to do that will have to be my little secret. There was rumors I went down to Georgie. Well, can't say where I went, but I'd always write proud that I stood up for the poor farmers of Johnson County. I sure hope they fared all right after I left. Judging from the looks of things, their descendants seem to be faring pretty well. So, I say, good evening and Godspeed. All right, and we're back. And our second ghost is played by another familiar face. She too had to duck out early. Uh, so this sound is going to be recorded, uh, was actually recorded from her, her home on her iPhone. So this sound is not going to match. But this is Joyce Kilpatrick Jordan, and she is... Paraby Thompson? I think it's... P-H-E-R-E. Paraby. Thompson. Not Thompson, Thompson. And she is a antebellum housewife. Okay. So, <laughs> enjoy, enjoy Joyce Kilpatrick Jordan's portray of Faraby Thompson. Good evening. I am Phoebe McCullough's Helmy Thompson, and you are standing next to the final resting place of my mortal remains. I was born in 1800 and died in 1858. I was a second wife to two husbands, but I still tried to hold my head high. My first husband was Dr. Robert Helmy, a widower who came here from Rhode Island in the early 1800s. He was a wealthy and respected man and much older than I. He was a state legislator and even tried to start a newspaper in Raleigh at one time. We lived on a large plot of land he owned on 2nd Street. Now, doctoring was not the lucrative profession as it is today, so we also had a plantation and over 20 slaves to work it. Well, all the well-to-do folk in these parts owned slaves, but... Dr. Helmer was not at all comfortable with it. In fact, he made a big speech to the State Agricultural Society over 200 years ago and told them that slavery was a dark blot on the South. He said our country would only be great when all labor was done by free people. Well, I'm telling you, a lot of folks did not like what he had to say because some of them were getting rich on slave labor. Sadly, neither he nor anyone else could come up with a way to end slavery. That would be for the next generation. Well, the good doctor died and left me a widow at 30 with two children, as well as a stepdaughter and servants to manage. I wasn't sure if I would ever marry again, but several years later, my sister Sally died. I married her husband to help take care of her six children and went from being a doctor's wife to a preacher's wife. The Reverend David Thompson was no ordinary preacher. He was also a merchant, a plantation owner, postmaster, and a state senator. Oh, yes, and he was also a loyal member of the Masons. Needless to stay, say, he did not stay at home very much. Before he married my sister, he had been a Baptist missionary in Georgia and Alabama. Yes, I said missionary. I guess those folks needed to be tamed. One thing he was most proud of was introducing a bill in the legislature to establish a free school in Johnston County. The bill passed and we had our first public school, but only for a short while. 
The old North State was pretty backward in those days and not many people wanted to pay taxes for schools. The next senator got the free school law repealed. Well, it did come up a few years later in the 1840s and we've had public schools ever since. The Reverend Mr. Thompson worked tirelessly for the Baptist, even though his father was Presbyterian and his mother Episcopalian. He helped to establish the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina in 1830. A few years later, they started a college called Wake Forest to train ministers. One of their goals was to start a church in every county seat. So Mr. Thompson led in getting churches started here in Smithfield and in other places such as Waynesboro, which I understand they now call Goldsboro. He helped to reorganize the Johnston Liberty, which is now the Clayton First Baptist Church. Many eyebrows were raised when Mr. Thompson and I married in 1837, just a few months after Sally's death. We had a daughter together at Lucy in 1838, and things went relatively smoothly in our marriage when an unspeakable tragedy struck. It's still too hard to think about. In late August 1844, Mr. Thompson became ill and died September 2nd. Our little girls, Sally and Lucy Ann, also became ill and died within hours of their father. The remains of all three lie here just a few feet away. Doctors said they had bilious fever. Later on, it was called typhoid. Back then, people had open wells and all sorts of bacteria from birds and insects would get into the drinking water. Lord, sometimes it was like drinking from a cesspool. But who knew? To add insult to injury, our home burned to the ground not long after this terrible tragedy. Fortunately, I had my first husband's home in town, so I fared all right for the rest of my days. I must admit, I lie here feeling a little bit like an interloper in the burial plot with my sister and her husband, our husband, with our gravestones falling on the ground. I never understood why I was destined for such a life. But don't feel sorry for me, for I was loved. And I feel certain that each one of you can say the same thing when your days on this earth are over. Good night. Next up, we have uh, William A. Smith, who is a planter, politician, and a militia commander. Um... I actually know those a few in Johnston County today. <laughs> and this uh, portray- is uh, portrayed by yet another familiar face to NLT, and that's Rich Nixon. So enjoy that. She got up and sleep. Well, this is all we have here. This is it. All right. Good evening, everyone. I am William Smith, or more commonly known around these parts as Major Bill. I was a member of the United States Congress, the North Carolina General Assembly, and I was president of the North Carolina Railroad. I was not born here. I moved to Johnston County from Warren County, where I was born in 1828. I did not die here, and I'm buried here. So you might be wondering what I'm doing here on this fine October evening. You might also wonder how it is that someone who was known as a union man in the late unpleasantness, uh, something I believe you folks call the Civil War, how a union man came to be a major in the North Carolina Home Guard. Let me tell you a story. When the war began, it is true, people said I was a union man because I believed that leaving the union would bring ruin to North Carolina I believe held by many of my fellow citizens right here in Johnston County who chose me to represent them in the Secession Convention in 1861, where I did vote against leaving the Union. Still, I got to be major. Well, many of us thought the Yankees would not fight, Uh, and we soon learned we were mistaken. At that point, many of us began to look for a place where we could better serve our government than to expose ourselves 
to the bullets of those vile Yankees. And for that, I relied upon Governor Vance, a man who had been a fellow unionist before the war and for whom I had hollered and spent money and campaigned to get elected. I went to the governor and I says, Governor, appoint me major in the Johnston County Militia, a power which he had. He got rid of me like a used mule. And so I had to stand for election by the troops. When it came time to give speeches, my opponent said, Boys, now is the time to put down your plow, pick up your guns, and fight to the last man. And I will lead you to where the fighting is the hottest. And I said, when it was my turn, my fellow citizens, I am not a fighting man. I am for peace. I have never lied to you, and I will not now. I am a candidate for major because I believe this is a position where I will not get hurt in this war. I think major in this battalion will be a safe place. And I can assure you, if you vote for me, no Yankee bullet will ever hit you or me. I will keep my best soldiers on scout and apprise us of when the Yankees are coming and my orders shall always be to fall back to keep us out of harm's way. Well, I won that election 217 votes to one. I became a major and I kept my promise. I even kept my boys out of harm's way with Billy Sherman and the entire Yankee army marched right through here in 1865. Well, by the 1880s, my health started to fail. And in 1888, I traveled to Richmond to the home of my son-in-law, Captain W.H. Green, to seek relief for my ailment. And it was there that I learned I was suffering from cancer of the stomach. And it was there that same year that I shuffled off this mortal coil. Because I was averse to the idea of my corporeal remains being entrusted to the care of a stranger of the public thoroughfares, it was there in Richmond that I was buried. That brings an end to my story. I bid you all farewell, Godspeed, and hope you have a pleasant rest of your evening. And thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. You are welcome. You are welcome, sir. I think this may be our last group, Major Bill. So <laughs> Thank you, sir. You can come and listen to this nice good. All right, for our fourth ghost, we have Elretta Melton Alexander, who was an attorney and judge in Johnston County, and she is portrayed by Dr. Wanda Robinson Lee. Enjoy. Hi, darlings. I'm Orita Melton Alexander. I live just a short distance from here. While my father was pastor of the First Missionary Baptist Church. My first recollection was of my mother crying when the sheriff showed up at her house with devastating news. Oh, my father had purchased property in the Belmont area only to find out he didn't own it. All because somebody broke the law. My family were evicted. We were a respectable family. And my father, man of the cloth, but soon after then, we moved away when I was small. But I considered Smithfield my small town. Well, my father took a church in Scotland Neck, North Carolina. We moved on to Danville, Virginia, and then 
went to Green's Bar where we settled. Oh, how I loved music. But I didn't really see that as a career for me. I started school when I was four years of age and I graduated when I was 14. So I guess you could say I had an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. When I was 13, I had to have my appendix removed. The doctor told my father I was a precocious child. <gasps> oh, I couldn't wait to get home, get the dictionary, and look up that word. Does anyone here know what precocious means? Well, it means that you are smarter than most people your age. So I guess you could say I was a precocious child. Well, a little while later, a couple of years later, I met and married a successful young doctor. I wanted to help this preacher who was running for Greensboro City Council. And I also wanted to learn more about the government. But he didn't win. But he said I would make a good lawyer. I was getting just a little upset with my husband. So I told him, I want to go back to school. He told me, the only way you go back to school is to go live with my mother in New York. Well, to spite him, uh-huh, I chose the most expensive college in New York City, Columbia. Well, I didn't know at the time that Columbia didn't have any black women in their college, but they accepted me. I was told, or they told me, that my performance would determine if other black women got to go to their school. Well, I just want you to know, I didn't disappoint them. So I continued on. I graduated at the end of World War II. I got my degree. I worked as the first black lawyer in the state of North Carolina. Then in the 60s, I was an elected judge in the state of North Carolina. And then in the 70s, I got this, I got this. I know I got a good chance. I believed I could win. I really did. But this man who was a fire extinguisher was sure salesman. He beat me. And he didn't even go to college. But Susie Sharp was the first woman in the Supreme Court. She beat him. Yes. So I guess you could say that North Carolina wasn't ready for a black woman to tread in a white man's world, or maybe it just wasn't my time. In Guilford County, I started this program, Judgment Day. And in this program, I mainly look for first time offenders. We all need some help sometimes, don't we? And I looked out for those first timers so they would not get criminal records. I started with community service. They would write a report about their crime and they would develop an action plan, which would, they would show how they would rehabilitate themselves. Well, all of those things were great, but then the 80s, crime and drugs 
just just really, really took off. And that was the end of my program. But even before that, when the gentleman would come back to read their reports to me, I would drop all charges. And I'd say, God forbid you come back into my courtroom again. I could be pretty tough. But I always want it to be known as fair. There was an opportunity which was really devastating to see how the men, the young men, and the other individuals were going into jail. And there was nothing that could be done I wish North Carolina would see that all we need is a little love and compassion and give people another chance, a second chance. There was someone who came into my courtroom with a lot of nonsense. And I would say, you better tell the truth and the truth will set you free. That is my message. I leave with you tonight. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. God bless. And then for our fifth ghost, we have Martin Luther Wilson, who was a school principal in Johnston County, and they are portrayed by Joe Scarborough. I'm good. My name is Martin Luther Wilson. I was born in 1905 in Currituck County, which is down towards Wilmington Way, right in the ocean. My mother and my father owned their land at a particular time. I used to go, love to go hunting and fishing, and I just, I just outdoors me. So, but I knew I wanted to be a teacher. So, at that particular time, there wasn't any option for being a teacher. So, they had one in Elizabeth, Elizabeth City. And that was all. Uh, they called it Teach for the Norm, which was special for teachers. So I went there and attended uh, in Lisbon City. So in Lisbon City, I went on to North Carolina A&T, which is still in Greensboro, North Carolina, in North Carolina Central. And while I was at a and I, I met my wife, Mildred. She went to a and in 1935, we were married. At that particular time, the population was exploding in Johnson County. But they, they had, at the time, there was there were three black schools. You had Clayton had William E. Cooper High School, East East Florida, for the SB, the Wilson Park Market. You had Johnson Century in Smithfield, you had Forest Hill. But they still, there was so much, there was so much rural population. They was building another school, but we still get to that. But me and my wife got our first job at Forest Hill High School. She taught second grade, and I was, we taught the other. Until then, they finished. They finally finished the fourth school in Selma in 1939, called Richby Harrison High School, and that's where they, that's when I left Forest Hill to be the first principal over at Richby Harrison High School in 1939. When I got to over in Selma, they also had to build there was a home across from the school so that I could walk to and from school because I like to say I want to be around the school. We also at the time like say we had to have a uh, we had bus drivers, but in that day, students drove the school buses. It wasn't for us. But you had to get the parents' permission for them to drive the school bus, plus they had to do the by grade. So that means that my job, we had to personally go out and talk to each parent about getting the parents, about getting the children to drive the school buses. And so we do that thing. A lot of times we go out there, in the, especially in the summertime, and they would be, because there was a lot of rural property, so folks have gardens, but like, back that day, everybody had a garden. And it was nothing for me to go out there by the station wagon and come back to the house and be loaded with all kind of goods, though. Like cabbage, potatoes, and all that in the back of my car. But we got back to Selma and, and uh, tried to keep acting and everything. My, my wife and I both saw that there was children that, even back then, that didn't have anything to do. So we decided it was okay 
she said, I'll be a Girl Scout. I'll be the Girl Scout leader. I said, I'll be the Boy Scout. So we, we established the first Boy Scout and Girl Scout troop in Selma, North Carolina. He done that. Plus two, they was uh, they were just talking about in the sixties, talking about that the uh, the housing, you know, people not having nowhere to stay, this and that. So the government nationwide did they, what they call the housing authority. So they got a bunch of us together. We, they picked the town of Selma, got certain people together on a committee, and I was selected one of the committee members. So we got the Selma Housing Authority, and in the sixties we opened up the uh, Selma Housing Authority over in Selma, North Carolina. I also was a mason at the time, so the island for one was a mason building. But I always trying to steal into all the students, you know, hard work, being honest, hard work, and like I said, value, you know, value, value your thing in life that the people for you value. Always steal and you know that. Always, always treat people like you want to be treated, everything. And that's why I try to steal into the students in seven and not two. And so uh, at the end, I went from 1939, I was first principal there. I was principal there until 1969. And in 1969 is when Carson of High School went away, and that's when they opened up Triple S High School over in Smithfield, North Carolina. But I, didn't, I, I did not start from being in the community. I just stopped from being a principal. I just retired from the school system. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Betty? I think you're done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and for our final ghost of the evening, we have William Ragsdale, a civil engineer, and is portrayed by good old Reggie Parker. Hey. Hello. How are you all doing this evening? Good. 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 And I'm glad to hear it. When I was on the other side of that wall, my name was Bill Ragsdale. And I was the forest warden of Johnson County. Now, I've lived in Smithfield just about all my life. I did go to Duke University for a while, played football there. Until I was injured in the 1929 Maryland game. I went from there over to State College and I got a degree in uh, civil engineering and then stuck around and got a master's degree in math. And I've had a lot of jobs. One of the jobs I had was uh, helping to do the layout and survey for a, for a little road that starts off down in Florida and goes all the way up the main side swipe Smithfield over here. It's called I-95. Also uh, built some federal housing. Probably the most important job I had though was uh, as a teacher over in Kenley where I met my wife Helen. Now I graduated State College at the height of the Great Depression, where everybody was looking for a job that few people were finding. Robert Holden here in Smithfield, he he helped me get a job as a fire spotter at the new Tuscarora Fire Tower. It was built by the WPA boys, probably some of the same guys that helped build this wall here. Anyway, after I'd been a fire spotter for a while, I was made uh, the, the, the forest warden for Johnson County. Very important job. My job was not only to spot fires, but also supervise all these other guys that spotted fires and to maintain the fire towers. And it was during this time, well, it was one of the reasons it's an important job, not only to serve, preserve the natural beauty of our forest, but also the lumber industry, very important for Johnson County. And if your forest burned down, you can't have a lumber industry. Anyway, it was during this period of time that uh, Something happened that made a huge impact. There's a bluff, a high bluff that overlooks a bend in Moccasin Creek down near Middlesex. And on the top of that high bluff, you'll find these. These are the Catawba rhododendron. Not supposed to be there. The only other place you're going to find them here in this state is going 200 miles west, and you'll find them in the western part of this state, but nowhere else except right here in Johnson County, in a place that's now called Flower Hill. Made such an impression on me that I went and talked to a buddy of mine, uh, 
botanist over at State College by the name of B.W. Wells. I had him come down and take a look at it, and he brought along another buddy of mine, Tom Laster, who was the owner, operator, editor, everything else of the, the newspaper, the Smithville Herald. Well, when B.W. saw this, he called it a, quote, freak of nature, end quote. Well, Tom picked that he put that phrase up, he put it in his newspaper article about that, and the news spread all over the place. Now, this was in 1937. The only reason these things were there was because during the last ice age, when the glaciers receded, they left this isolated spot. When the word got out about these Catawba rhododendrons, this freak of nature, even though it was at the height of the Great Depression, people wanted to come down to see it. Why? Because everybody wants to go see a freak show. Anyway, <laughs> they came. They came in huge numbers. They came all the way from Canada, all over the nation. <clears throat> they came, so many of them came that they clogged the roads here in Johnson County. On the first Sunday in May of 1937, I counted 3,500 people. Those were actually the people that logged in. There were probably a lot more. Same thing happened in 1938. By 1939, the interest had begun to dwindle, and fewer and fewer people came, and that continued. That worried me. That worried me because I thought that if something was not eventually done, the lumber industry would destroy that beautiful, natural phenomenon that we have here in Johnson County. So I tried to buy that 25 acre tract. I tried to buy it twice and I failed both times, but because of the, uh, the Triangle Nature Conservancy, because of that organization, they went in and they purchased it along with the help of the good people of Johnson County. And because of that, you can go over there today. I would wait until May. <laughs> you can go over there and you can take a look at one of the most beautiful sites you're liable to see. 25 acres of these things. Now, in May, what's going to happen is this tiny little bud here at the end is going to grip bigger and it's going to explode into one of the most be largest, beautiful flowers that you've ever seen. Are they white? No, they're purple. Oh. Purple flowers. Uh, some of them have kind of a whitish tinge to them, but most of them are, are, are real deep purple. Uh, but if you've never been, you need to go up to Flower Hill near Middlesex and take a look at them in May, around Mother's Day, somewhere around Mother's Day. And if you, well, if you've never been, you need to go. If you have been, I think you'll want to go again uh, and see them. But uh, that's that's my story, folks, and they saved the worst till last. <laughs> You all have a good evening. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Bill. Yes, sir. All right, folks. That was uh, our Ghost Walk episode. We hope you've enjoyed these different portrayals of uh, historical figures from the Johnston County area. And we will have coming up on a uh, episode featuring the cast and crew from Boeing Boeing. And that'll be about an a uh, week and a half, two weeks, something like that. We're not as stringent on the every two weeks thing these days because, number one, there's a lot going on. Rehearsals, surgeries, you know, remodels, stuff like that. So we're not going to be as stringent on the every two weeks schedule from here on out. But we will have an episode dedicated to Boeing Boeing, our next show opening November 11th at Noose Little Theater. So please look forward to that. And we hope you enjoy this little spooky edition of Noose Little Podcast. And for uh, my producer, Mita Tool. Hello. And me, Matt Gore, we hope you've enjoyed this and have a wonderful, happy Halloween. There you go. Credits for the show. Your host and creator is Matt Gore. That's me. My producer and editor is Mita Tool. That's me. Music is by Cody Walker. Uh, please go look up Cody on uh, Cody Walker Music on YouTube. And he's also on Cody Walker Music on Facebook as well. He's local, so uh, and he's got a couple of albums out. You know, uh, Easy listening, John, John Denver type of uh, guitar voice, that Cody Walker. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.